Every day, tens of thousands of patients go to sleep for surgery, or so we think. Anywhere from 1 in 10,000 up to 1 in 1,000 patients might be awake under the knife of surgery without your doctor knowing. You're going to learn the top three things that your doctor is on the lookout for to make sure you're actually asleep when you're supposed to be sleeping on the table, and what you can tell your doctor to make sure that they're doing their job correctly. We're going to go in order of the most obvious signs that you might be a little bit awake under anesthesia, and then go towards the least obvious signs, the more subtle ones that your brain or body might be awake in surgery. The first is your heart rate, blood pressure, and respiratory rate. The most primitive language of your body to signal that it's in fight-flight mode or secretly awake. Your anesthesiologist is always measuring your pulse oximeter and your EKG and your blood pressure and respiratory rate when you're having surgery. We're not just looking at the heart rate and the oxygen content, and this is me by the way, but we're also looking at the changes in heart rate that might happen if your body's awake or it becomes aroused under anesthesia. We have all sorts of crafty ways of measuring these signals, including from your earlobe or your ear cartilage, from your nose, or even your lips. Like in patients who have nail polish and we can't measure their pulse oximetry from their fingers. When you're under anesthesia in a steady state, your heart rate and blood pressure don't change very much, nor does your respiratory rate. But if there's a surgical stimulation that your body is not adequately anesthetized for, it might react. It doesn't tend to react with movement. We'll talk about that next. That's because you have medications that paralyze your skeletal muscle so you can't move in response to having surgical pain. But those medications like succinylcholine here or rocuronium don't block your autonomic nervous system and that's why your heart rate and blood pressure can still respond. So assuming you're not taking medication that falsely lowers or raises your heart rate, your anesthesiologist follows the dose of anesthesia based on how your heart rate and blood pressure are doing. The higher the heart rate and blood pressure, the higher the chance that you're not adequately anesthetized and might be feeling some of that pain. The lower the heart rate and blood pressure, usually it means that you're not awake, but there are many exceptions. Many of our medications to control your heart rate and blood pressure, like metoprolol and lambetalol here, can alter your heart rate in a way that we can't use those signals as precisely as if you didn't have those medications affecting your heart. And that's where your respiratory rate can be helpful if you're not paralyzed. Not all surgeries require paralysis. Those that don't require paralysis mean that you're still initiating breathing on your own and we follow your respiratory rate on the same monitors. We measure the CO2 that you breathe out called your end tidal carbon dioxide on the monitor here. And every blip on that monitor is an indicator of you exhaling. And if you're exhaling faster than you were before, it means that your body might be under some stress. The higher the respiratory rate, the more likely that your body is not getting enough anesthesia. You breathe into the monitor to test to make sure that the monitor is working. That's my breath right there in white. So your anesthesiologist is combining all of these vital signs in your body to make a determination of whether you need more or less anesthesia. And that determines how awake you are or are not. The second sign that your body might not be adequately anesthetized is based on movement. Like I said, many of the medications that we use might paralyze your body, but if you're not paralyzed, there might be subtle changes in movement that might indicate that you're not fully asleep. It's usually not the patient sitting up in the bed and kicking the surgeon. Usually it's much more subtle because you're still asleep, maybe just not 100% asleep. So it might be small movements like your fingers moving or your toes wiggling or swallowing and seeing the muscles of your oropharynx act Activated. Sometimes it's tearing from the eyes or even seeing the eyeballs moving under the eyelids. It would be great if you could just tell us how you're doing instead of having to do these subtle movements, but usually you can't because you have a breathing tube in place. It sits right here behind your tongue and that prevents you from speaking when you're under anesthesia. It's very rare for a patient with that breathing tube in place to use their hands in 
instead to indicate that they need help or they're awake or they're locked into their body. And that's why your body has to be scanning for more subtle clues. You can sometimes see very fine movements from the monitors themselves, like small glitches in how a patient is breathing that might show up on the monitor, or glitches in the pulse oximeter from small movements of the finger, because you can see little changes on the oximeter when I'm moving my finger in ways that you might not see if the hands are covered by drapes under anesthesia when they're having surgery. So it's a combination of directly visualizing the patient and trying to interpret data from the monitors about what might be happening in areas that you can't see, like the diaphragm or the digits. Modern day anesthetics are so powerful that anesthesia awareness is pretty rare, but sometimes a patient has a little bit of subconscious awakening that they don't even remember in surgery. It's like they're 99.9% .9 asleep, but a tiny little bit of subconscious memory is still active. I've identified this in patients months or even years after surgery when they have signs of PTSD, but without a clear trigger. Like there was no abuse of childhood, no traumas that they can remember that have happened in the past, but they have all the signs of hypervigilance and hyperarousal. Sometimes they'll have fear of going to doctor's offices or hospitals or fear of having procedures done to their body. I've seen patients who flinch at even the lightest touches on their skin, and it can sometimes delay them seeking help for medical conditions if this fear gets built up higher and higher in their brain. And it's a very scary type of trauma because the patient doesn't consciously remember it, but it's as if the body remembers having something done to it in surgery without being adequately anesthetized. It's like a covert trauma because your brain wasn't fully awake enough to remember the trauma, but it's carried within patients. I've spoken to many therapists who have not identified this in patients because they can't verbalize the trauma that happened to them when they were here on this table. It's why I always do a comprehensive history and physical on patients coming to me with new onset PTSD in the absence of identifiable triggers because every once in a while it's from a medical trauma that happened that they simply can't fully remember, but their body has kept score. I've done many videos on where the body keeps score. I don't believe it's all in the head. I think a lot of it is in that nerve, that stellate ganglion in the neck. You can watch my videos linked below on how we numb that nerve to help quiet PTSD in many patients who have this deeply ingrained trauma. But the most important thing for doctors and therapists who can't identify clear triggers is to ask about medical procedures. And if you suspect something happened to a patient when they were partially anesthetized, you need to immediately get them help. Ideally, as soon as the surgery is over, but even if it's weeks or months later, you want to minimize any further delay. So if you're having surgery or you know a loved one who's having surgery, what can you do to help minimize the risk of underdosing the anesthesia to minimize the risk of small amounts of anesthesia awareness so that you don't end up with trauma on the flip side of surgery. You don't want to fix the body just to break the mind. The first step is to be honest with your anesthesiologist about all the medications and drugs that you use, especially alcohol, cannabis, and methamphetamines and cocaine. All of these substances impact your brain's tolerance to anesthesia, and you might need higher doses to be 100% asleep. So your heart rate and blood pressure and movement might not always be perfect signs of awareness if your brain needs so much more to stay asleep. You also need to be honest with your doctor about your psychological and mental health history. Patients with PTSD and in particular don't always respond the way that I'd expect to the standard anesthetic medications. They're also more likely to wake up from anesthesia with unusual reactions, what we call emergence delirium, and emergence delirium can be a setup for PTSD after surgery. You want your anesthesiologist to know your history so that they can give you the right medications to minimize those risks from spiraling out of control. You also want to optimize your heart health before surgery. Remember I told you that some medications lower your heart rate or raise your heart rate from our little goodie bag here? If your heart is not healthy, we can't always give you the full dose of anesthesia or we have to give medications that might mask underdoses of anesthesia. And the healthier your heart is before surgery, the less likelihood there's going to be of masking of what your body is trying to tell us when you're asleep. And it's largely because anesthesia depresses heart function. So if your heart function is already low, we can't always give you much more anesthesia. And if we can't give you enough anesthesia, that's when subtle bits of anesthesia awareness might break through. 
And lastly, check out my videos on how to prepare for surgery to minimize the risk of psychological damage happening here in the operating room. I've linked many videos below in the description. Check out my San Francisco Clinic's website linked below to learn more about how I treat patients who have struggled with medical PTSD or other types of medical gaslighting when doctors can't figure out what's happened to their brain and body. And check out this video here about how hormones affect your brain and the rest of your body when you're having surgery and anesthesia. Hit that like button and share what you've learned with others and be sure to subscribe to keep up with all of my medical content. And remember, you have more power over your health than you've probably ever been told.